I grew up in a very macho family with three brothers, no sisters, a mother who was a tomboy. So we had almost no feminine side to us, you know. That, that, that uh, was difficult when I got married. I had to learn all the stuff that I should have learned earlier. But yeah, to basically say it, I was uh, hooked on athletics and sports. I loved baseball at the time. Later, I fell more in love with football. I did well in school and enjoyed traveling. I thought when, when we were younger, like when I got to be uh, Oh, about 10 or 11, we did trips around the United States. Then later, at age 14, a pretty neat thing happened. Our, our family was, they were well-to-do, we we'll to say it that way, because we owned uh, our own business, and the business grew, and they're very responsible business people. My dad, my granddad, my uncles, the cousins, so we grew up in, in the, the family business, which got bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. Well, anyway, uh, we saved our money so that we could go around the world. And at age 14, we went around the world. It was a life changer. We took off out of Los Angeles International, and I thought that I, uh, at that age, I thought that I liked uh, sports and Oh, maybe a little bit of girls, you know, not uh, the typical amount. But by the time that trip was over, I knew that I was in love with aviation and travel. And they seemed to uh, blend together and create a life of adventure. And that's what I was really attracted to. So about age 14, with that trip, having gone to... Uh, Gosh, all of Europe, I guess I could explain all the different places, but all of Europe and, uh, uh, gosh, uh, the Middle East and Israel, of course, and uh, Africa, and lots of different places that I recall. And by the time I got back, um, I was pretty much internally hooked on being a pilot. But then I thought, how could that be? I, I don't know any pilots. I don't know really anything about that. And about that time, I come to find out my next door neighbor, right next door was a quiet, retired airline pilot. He had uh, fought through World War II, and uh, he was a pilot, and he tried to talk me out of becoming a pilot. So as soon as I had a desire to be a pilot, my next door neighbor tried very hard to talk me out of it. It'll be gone all the time. You'll, it'll be hard on your marriage and all these things anyway. But that's kind of what happened up till about age 15 uh, is I had uh, a, a lot of interest in travel, in aviation, and I was good in school. I got good grades. Uh, it was not hard, you know, and I did well in sports. And uh, that was, I was clean cut, you know, but you know what happened to me as time went on? I started becoming more and more self-confident and then becoming more and more selfish. Then, if you could take that a little further, self-absorbed. When I started going to college, man, I felt like I had the world by the tail. I felt like I knew everything about the world that was necessary to know and I was ready to conquer it, but I needed to get my BA degree and I needed to get all of my pilot certificates, which would include, a lot of pilots would know what I'm talking about, but a commercial instrument, multi-engine, CFI, CFII, ATP, all the things that pilots understand. And so I had my future well planned. I'm gonna get through college. I'm gonna get uh, an airline pilot job. I'll probably have a girlfriend in every continent, <laughs> and I will be rich. <laughs> and as uh, on the side, I always had the family business that I get to come back to. And since I grew up there, uh, you know, I had a, a leadership position in the family business, mainly in trucking and in sales and maintenance. Anyway, so that was my, my plan. I had my life all figured out. 
there was not much question what I was going to do. I was a, a strange kid in some ways because I knew for sure that I wanted to be a pilot when I grew up. I didn't start technically flying till age 18. That was my first flight. And uh, everybody remembers their first flight. <laughs> they also remember their first solo flight. And that happened here in Southern California. Oh yeah, 18. And I had to wait until I was 18. And I had to pay for all of my lessons. My dad was a good businessman, um, a strong kind of an individual. Uh, but he said, yeah, okay, go ahead and fly if you want to, but, uh, you know, I don't know how you're going to do that and run the family business. And so there was kind of a, a conflict. My next door neighbor didn't want me to fly. My dad was not for it. My mom was worried about it. And so I had to come up with ways to leave and go fly on my own. And of course, I paid for everything on my own, too. So uh, it, it was an interesting uh, start. Not like a lot of pilots. Uh, most people get support or, you know, somebody's paying for their lessons. Uh, but I had to semi-sneak out <laughs> and learn to fly, and it started at age 18. I've flown for almost 50 years now, if you put it all together. I've been flying ever since I started. And I have, I started out in the general aviation community. Uh, that means flying, but not military. So I started out in general aviation, expecting to go into the military. The Vietnam War was raging during my era, but this airplane crash occurred and it changed everything. I ended up staying in the civilian world and uh, worked very hard, very, very, very hard to try to overcome the injuries and the memory loss and all that. Uh, and so it was a long, hard, arduous road, if I may say. It took me uh, several years to kind of get back to where um, I was, you know, before the crash. It took, so it took quite a time to get just break even where I was. And then from there, I decided that to be an airline pilot was going to be very tough, really tough, because I had so many injuries. And I told God I would never lie or falsify an application or an interview. And I, I had some my colleagues that did do that, and so they were able to go into the airlines before me, but I was not going to do that. Is either God was going to pave the way for me, or he wasn't. And uh, so 200 airline applications of rejection, always the same reason. I can't pass a physical. Because I answered the question, yeah, yeah, I've been unconscious. Yeah, yeah, I've been in a coma. Yeah, yeah, I've got this broken, this broken. Yeah, I mean, it's just a long list. As it turned out, I kind of overcompensated and became a really, kind of a really good flight instructor. And I thought, maybe this is what I'll do. I started training pilots and found out that I had an influence uh, in a small way, but to me it was, it was enough. I could influence the whole aviation safety program by training pilots who would then tell other pilots who would then fly passengers for their whole career and be better and safer pilots. And I really enjoyed it. And I actually found my way uh, very fulfilled as a flight instructor in the civilian world. But then I got hired by an airline who finally said, yeah, go ahead. And I started flying with one airline. Then I flew with a big airline, a major, a large worldwide airline. It happened to be the same airline that I took my first flight with back when I was 14, when we went around the world. My first flight was in a TWA Boeing 707. And uh, this would be 1964, if you want to note that date. Well, it was weird, because by the time I get hired for TWA, uh, the 707 was being phased out. And they were bringing in new airplanes, of course. But out of 300 pilots that were hired at TWA when I was hired, they chose 11 to go right on to the 707 
for some reason, they picked me, the only uh, civilian, the rest were military, and they picked me. So as it turned out, um, 10 years after the airplane crash, I was flying in the airplane as a pilot, licensed pilot, trained pilot for TWA, TWA uniform, uh, in the same airplane that I fell in love with when I was 14. <laughs> it seems weird. That, because of what I didn't tell you, is uh, that I had a dream that I turned to God and I said, God, my dream was to fly a 707. I didn't even ask him to fly TWA, but that was my dream to fly with TWA. Anyway, it turned out that I was hired to, to fly the 727 because we were all going to go on the 727. While we were in training, they took 11 people out and put us on the 707, and I didn't even ask for it. They just picked me. It was kind of weird. But uh, those that know me would say, well, that was just another uh, amazing, intricate detail about God answering prayer, <laughs> a child's prayer. So I flew for 50 years. I've flown most of the airplanes that passengers have ridden on. I've flown them from the simulators, you know, the big $400 million wraparound simulators. And then I ended up being an instructor in them. And then one thing led to another, and I ended up being, being what they call a, a standards captain. A lot of airlines call them standards captain. That means that you're checking the captains, making their, giving them their test. Every year they have to come back and get retrained, and then they have to go through a test. So I ended up doing that. And I ended up working uh, as a FAA examiner in the Boeing 737, doing the same thing. And I've flown a lot of the corporate jets and a lot of the small airplanes and the 747 and, and below. So I've had a, a variety of experience and I've been everywhere twice. And they say this, the pilots say, once you've been everywhere twice, it's time to retire. <laughs> well, I'd been everywhere twice by about age 40. So it was time, I had really, I really, once I got back on my feet after the airplane crash, I did a lot of things and I did them very, very fast. I really worked hard. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I've flown a lot of airplanes, had a lot of adventures, have a lot of stories, not unlike a lot of pilots too. But mine are, mine are, my stories are, they're different because I had given my heart to Jesus Christ uh, during this uh, time of the airplane crash. And every day thereafter, I mean, I, I was trying to just do what he told me to do.